Hello and welcome to episode 14 of the Haxton Knits podcast. I am so glad you're here with me today. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Haxton Knits. Um, what are you going to find here? So this is a knitting podcast. I am an American living in Okinawa, Japan. I am a master knitter and I do a lot of other side side quests too. So you'll see knitting, spinning, weaving, crochet, uh, home brewing, cross stitch, whatever, whatever comes up. Uh, that's what I'm talking about here, as well as little snippets of my life here in Okinawa, Japan for your viewing pleasure. Let's get started, guys. things out with some announcements real quick. I announced last week that I launched the Haxton Knits Ravelry group. So if you're interested in participating in any of our knit alongs, make alongs, or just any general chatter, if you have questions for me or questions about life here in Okinawa, you can throw those in over on the Ravelry group page. And to kick off that group, we started the Challenge Yourself Make Along. So that, that make along will be going on for the next three months. And the goal is to challenge yourself to do a new technique, something you've never done before, without the um, help of your maybe local knitting experts or local yarn shop. Um, so yeah, let's just take this time to embrace the fact that maybe we don't have the help that we need available to us, but we are all very smart and independent people and have the ability to go out and seek references on our own. And so every week I think what I'm going to do is share some references or places where I like to go when I'm not sure how to do a technique to look that up ahead of time. And so this week I wanted to talk about Vogue knitting. I know I mentioned this several weeks in a row that I use this Vogue knitting book a lot, especially when I was doing my master knitter um, program. And I noticed recently, so pretty much all of this was available online at the Vogue knitting website. And when I was getting ready to record this podcast today, I went looking for that so I could link it down below. And I noticed that their website had been rearranged and the stuff just wasn't I couldn't find it. And so I just did a general search for things that I know I've looked for before, like buttonholes or um, different type of cast-ons. And I was able to find all of the stuff that used to be on the Vogue Knitting website over on the Knit Simple Magazine website. I am assuming that Knit Simple Magazine is part of like the conglomerate, you know, involved in the same publishing house as Vogue Knitting is, but I put a link in the down bar. That is probably one of my favorite resources online for tips or tricks because they have really nice drawings and, and written instructions. So you get a drawing and a written instruction for a variety of different techniques. And it's just really a good, um, like basic, basic, um, you know, they show you five different types of buttonholes or, you know, um, three or four different types of increases, decreases, things like that. So if you are looking for a resource for how to do various techniques that you haven't seen before, go check out Knit Simple Magazine. And then um, another resource I wanted to talk about, so I was going to refer you guys over to the Knitting Guild Association Ravelry Group. They have on their um, group pages, like a list of references by topic. And I noticed that a lot of them were for the Knitting Guild Association website, which means that if you're not a member, you can't access them. But um, the current head of the Knitting Guild Association is Orenda Holiday, and she runs her own blog and has um, an index on the blog with a lot of different techniques um, linked so that you can go to her particular blog posts about those techniques. And then all of her blog posts are linked to videos on YouTube. So you can go check out her YouTube channel or her blog. And I have that also linked below. So if you are participating in this make along, I am so excited to hear um, what you're doing, what you're up to. I will show you my progress in the, um, in the works in progress section later on.
Before I jump into my finished objects this week, I always like to talk about what I'm wearing. And viewers of this channel will have seen this particular knit before. This pattern is called Nell and it's by Airy TML. And it is just a gorgeous, simple top to wear. I'm gonna scoot back just a little bit, but not too far because I'm plugged into a microphone here. But um, this particular shirt is knit in destination yarns, the yarn, base is called silver shiny because it's a it's got a silver sparkle through it and the color is coal mine let's see can you see yes and then just a little bit of detail is done in malabrigo sock yarn in the color pearl i have said many things about malabrigo yarn over the years as far as sock yarn goes but um it works great. I don't know that I would use it a lot for socks. And <laughs> I, I laugh about that because of course, later on I'll show you these guys, which definitely is made in the exact same Malabrigo sock yarn in the colorway Pearl. Um, but yes, beautiful. Um, it was quite a lengthy knit because it is fingering weight yarn and it's got a lot of positive ease and a lot of loose gauge, but it was fun, fun to work on. So let's move on. <laughs> finished objects this week. Of course, you guys know Sock Madness is going on. Uh, if you're not participating, you might be a little sick of hearing me talk about it, but I would just finished round three of Sock Madness and check these guys out. Oh my gosh. This is the Lacy Not Lazy pattern and it is just gorgeous. So it's done in two colors. Um, you're alternating one row of uh, your main color, one row of your contrast color, and then you are doing slip stitches to um, make these patterns here. So there is a very simple cable, which I did without a cable needle, a very simple lace pattern, and a very simple slip stitch pattern, which is done to sort of maintain this, you know, this gray line here, this colored cable line here, um, and rolled cuffs. So this is definitely my favorite sock so far of Sock Madness, which is really funny because the um, Diamond Duality sock, Diamond Duality? Nope, mm -hmm. not the Diamond Duality, the Braid A Lot sock. When I finished that one and put it on, I was like, oh, these are my favorite socks, favorite. And then this pattern came out and I knit it and it was just like, oh, I take it back. These are my new favorite. Um, I've just really, really been enjoying the Sock Madness socks this year, so I'm super excited. Um, these guys, like the last round, I, after I, so I, you have to knit the socked pattern. I was approved and then I pulled out a little bit of the toe and then bound, um, and finished the toe again, basically because the socks were just a little bit too long the way they were worked. The yarn I am using, I'm actually kind of excited about. So this is Crafting My Chaos, which is hand dyed in Georgetown, Texas. And I bought this at uh, Yarnivore when I was in San Antonio. This yarn is a self-striping yarn in the colorway Rainbow Sherbert. So whenever a new pattern drops, the first thing I do is I grab out this basket of sock yarn that I have, and I just start laying out colors that I think are gonna work really well together. And usually what I will do is ask my husband to come and help because he has a really good sense of color. And this time he picked out this yarn initially for me to use. Um, and you know, I, I do love this color. It's really pretty, but it was actually just a little bit too busy for this particular pattern, which is crazy because this is the yarn I ended up using instead, which is really, kind of busy too, but this one is a self-striping yarn. So the Crafting My Chaos is self-striping and um, it just worked out really well for this pattern. So I had initially, um, this time when the pattern dropped, I was able to start right away as opposed to last round where I was about two days behind everyone. And the first day um, the pattern dropped maybe about two hours before I normally go to bed and I knit the cuff and just like maybe half of a repeat in this color and knew, I just knew it wasn't right. And it's funny cause I actually didn't want to hurt my husband's feelings by like pulling the sock out and changing colors. Cause you know, he picked the colors out. Um, but in the morning I looked at it and I said, no, it's not going to work. And so I pulled that out and then um, proceeded to knit with the rainbow sherbet colorway. And I'm really glad I did. These turned out beautifully. 
Um, this is the end of uh, round three for Sock Madness, and this is how far I got last year. Round three was the last year that I completed as a finisher. So I know next round I'm really going to have to knit fast if I want to keep going. I think the next round only 10 participants per group make it through. This round it was 20 and I was definitely in the second half of the finishers. So um, I know I'm not going to get probably past round four or five. Like that's where I'm going to end. I'm certainly not going to be in the last, um, you know, round six and seven with the fastest knitters. But it's been super fun to participate. So far, I think 22 of the teams have already finished. And that's kind of fast. You get a two week period. And if people haven't finished by two weeks, they're just unfortunately out. And usually there are quite a few people who don't finish, all the spots don't get filled. But right now as it stands, there's only 14 spots left. So of the teams that haven't finished, there's still only 14 spots available to move on for the whole competition. So that is crazy. When you think that we started out at, I don't know, was it 500, 1,000 people? Um, so really, it's starting to get into the real fun part of the competition. Definitely this next round, I'm gonna have to dedicate some time and sit down and knit. This last round, I remember I had a day off with my husband and I thought, oh, I could sit and knit all day or we could spend some time together. And in this case, I really prioritized our time together. So we'll see. The next round, I have to be a little more serious and uh, bunker down if I wanna make it through. But that's awesome. Those are done. Now I can move on to other knitting. It's kind of, you know, the sock madness rounds. Um, I don't get a lot of time for other knitting or other crafting. So it's a little bit of a light episode for that. But that is it for my finished objects. Let's move on to works in progress. So I mentioned before that I am also participating in the Challenge Yourself Make Along. I do not have my progress here to physically show you, but I'll pop some pictures in here. Uh, as you saw in the previous weeks, I decided that I wanted to try to make some clothing out of my wo weaving, woven fabric. Um, and what's really exciting is this project is being completely made with scraps. So the yarn that I used to make my initial bit of woven fabric is left over from the Victorian raffia cowl. Um, and I want to talk about that. So Victorian raffia is this gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous double knit pattern. And the one of the authors of this pattern was actually interviewed on Fruity Knitting this week. So it was exciting to see him talk um, about the pattern and about all the double knitting. I decided not to do it as a piece of double knitting. Um, the pattern is for a scarf and what I did instead was I knit in the round and made it a cowl that was kind of a double thick infinity cowl. In the end, I, you know, I'm not as thrilled with it as I could have been. I think probably I should have just bunkered down and done the double knit scarf, but I didn't really need a scarf. And even when I lived in cold weather climates, I didn't really wear scarves. I was much more... Um, interested in cowls and of course in hindsight I could have done it as a double knit cowl instead of knitting in the round like I did but um, the pattern is gorgeous and it kind of made me think during the interview about on fruity knitting um, the author of this pattern talked about how some of the early double knitting was done to make tubes on flat needles and I thought, isn't that interesting? Wouldn't it be interesting to make like a pair of gloves, but completely on flat needles without having to seam up? So you're basically, if you've done double knitting before, you know that you make a double layer of fabric that is not connected in the middle, just connected kind of on the sides or wherever color changes happen. So if you wanted to do a solid color, solid colored pair of like gloves or mittens, you could do it on flat needles by doing double knitting. And I thought that was really interesting and something I might want to fiddle with and, and try my hand at doing. So maybe we'll see. Uh, that might be something I, I fiddle with in the future just to see if I can do it. So that was exciting. Um, so yes, the woven fabric came from leftover yarns from the Victorian raffia pattern the orange. So what I did this week was I knit basically from here up. Actually, it's a good thing I'm wearing this shirt because this pattern has a line right here. Can you see it? Maybe. Um, but basically I laid my woven fabric down to here and then I knit 
the top part up of a sweater. So I knit um, a crew neckline for the front and the back. And then my plan will be just to do a drop shoulder. Um, and so that yarn, which I'll show the picture here, is leftovers from my weekender sweater. And then I'm going to do along the, the sides and probably up over the sleeve to make that drop sleeve is leftover yarn from my arrows down sweater. So really exciting. I'm excited to be using scraps for this project because I don't know how it's gonna turn out. I don't know if it's gonna fit well or look nice. Um, but it's been fun to try to make something out of my woven fabric and it's just sort of um, made me want to do a little more weaving. I do have some acquisitions this week, which is for weaving, so I'll show you those in just a minute. Um, as far as other works in progress, I have been continuing to knit away on my Luminosity sweater. Luminosity is a pattern by Tannis Fiber Arts. I highly recommend you go check out her shop and check out her YouTube channel because she and her husband are um, a small company in Canada that um, dye and write patterns. And here is my progress on this guy. Um, Really, I'm just in the final couple inches at the bottom of this. I have to figure out how I want to end this sweater. Um, I am following her pattern, and her pattern calls for a split, um, a split hem at the bottom. And I'm just not sure if I wanna do that or not. So we'll play around with that. And then I plan on making this short sleeve. So somewhere here I will pick up and probably do just a little small color work. I really love this highlighter color. And so um, I might just add a little bit of color here and a little bit of color down at the bottom just to make this a little more interesting. Uh, this yarn is also Tannis Fiber Arts. This is in her Pure Wash fingering. And I know I've talked about this on previous episodes, but the Pure Wash is um, a little bit more environmentally friendly super wash wool, which is something that um, they do over at the Tannis Fiber Arts. I know they said in their recent videos that right now they're having a hard time getting a hold of that base because of all of the coronavirus and shipping and those sorts of issues. But you can definitely still buy some of her other bases, which are just not the pure wash. This main color here is Peacock and it is really bright. Um, actually, I think the lighting is doing pretty well on this color. I am alternating skeins and I'm really glad that I did that because one of my skeins had a little bit more of this sort of white color than the other one. I think maybe you can tell in this section up here, you can tell that there's just none of those white flashes, whereas down here there are. Thankfully, it's split up by the um, color work. I actually did a couple of rows without alternating skeins down here too, so you might be able to see that just the first one or two rows have none of that lighter flash of light blue. So always a good idea I'm doing helical knitting to break up those um, little color differences between the two balls of hand dyed yarn. And then of course I have been continuing to plug away on my cross stitching. Uh, cross stitch, man, I put a lot of hours in and I don't feel like I get a lot out of it. So this project um, I think is going to be with me for years and years and years to come. I was getting pretty lost in my pattern, so I did go ahead and kind of grid out some of the lines there using a, um, you know, the markers that are meant for writing on fabric, the in, like disappearing ink markers. So hopefully there will be some good progress on that another time for you. I'm just, I'm not as interested in cross stitch, so I don't feel like I want to share it as much here on the podcast, but I'm sure there are people out there who are interested more in it. Um, I would love to hear tips or tricks for working on some of these large projects because I am definitely finding that I'm getting a little bit lost. Um, I'm getting lots of yarn tangles. I'm getting kind of messy in the back. Let's show you my backsides here. Not too bad, but a little bit messier than I personally like. So if you have tips or tricks about um, cross stitch or large cross stitch projects, I would love to hear them. So that is actually it for my knitting and crafting content this week. Um, let's just talk a little bit about life here in Okinawa. Um, 
you know, of course I have to do my coronavirus update because I know I have friends and family in the States that are watching and kind of interested. Um, if you are maybe local or one of my friends or family members and you are interested in getting up-to-date information about coronavirus cases here on island, the website that I'm getting all this information from is okinawa.stopcovid19.jp slash en and i'll link that below um, but it's kind of interesting they've been doing daily updates of um, positive cases how many cases have been tested that day how many people are hospitalized how many people have severe cases how many people have mild or moderate cases how many deaths and how many discharges they also tell you um, the age and location of all of the new cases which I have thought to be really really interesting um, because it hasn't been just like really old people I thought it was gonna be all like 70s 80s 90s and there's definitely been a mix of 20s 30s 40s 50s 60s um, they also have a map where they show updates of kind of where the hot spots are on the island. Obviously, this is a small island, so at this point, <laughs> kind of the whole island's a hot spot. But um, we have had kind of a nice little like flattening. Uh, we basically had like a little spike of cases and a little drop of cases, and it's really hard because I know the rest of the world is having. A lot harder time than we are here and I also know that just because we're seeing cases decline here doesn't mean we're done it's sort of this um, it's actually kind of causing me more anxiety now that I'm seeing the cases drop because I feel like oh uh, when is the real when is the real wave coming so we are of course uh, social distancing staying at home not doing any any really fun out and about things I did go hiking so right now um, we are authorized to do uh, outdoor activities such as running hiking or swimming as long as we're maintaining social distancing while we're doing it I went and hiked Katsudake or Mount Katsu which is up um, kind of north of Nago it's right next to Awadake in fact the trail actually ends at the trailhead for Awadake Awadake oh, Japanese forgive me my Japanese speaking friends um, and it was gorgeous, gorgeous hike. I was really glad I went because I was going a little bit stir crazy, but I think I will not be going again because it was actually really busy. There were a lot of people on the trails and so that made it tricky, especially on sort of narrow um, ledges and rocky outcroppings to stay away from other people. So if I do do any more hiking, do do. <laughs> So if I do go and do any more hikes, I think um, I might seek more remote locations or maybe not going on weekends, kind of um, pick weekdays to go. I will of course put in a couple of pictures here. The view was really just beautiful. I happened to pick a gorgeous day. It was pretty hot, um, which is weird. We had like one warm day and then we've been back into kind of rainy cold. Um, cooler days, which has been really nice. In fact, everyone around me has been saying like, ah, I'm kind of surprised it's a little so cool outside. It's not, it's not gotten hot yet. So uh, summer is on its way in. And I know for me, that means that hiking is on its way out. Uh, it just gets too hot here. So I am mainly a wintertime hiker when it comes to Okinawa, which is really funny because in Alaska, I was mainly a summertime hiker because I'm a weenie about hiking in the snow. Here I'm a weenie about hiking in the heat. And of course the snakes are a lot more active in the summertime too. So we'll see, we'll see how the hiking updates go. Maybe I'll uh, toughen up and go do some hikes in the warmer weather. The other thing I've been working on is this. Ah, now those of you who watch my show know that I am a home brewer and I make beer, but this is not beer. This is kombucha. Ah, so I actually, I purchased this from a friend here on the island. This is a green tea kombucha. And for those of you who aren't familiar, kombucha is a fermented drink. It's made out of tea, sugar, and scoby, which is a bacteria and yeast colony. So kind of like beer, um, with beer, you have yeast and you are fermenting the sugars in your beer, which are malt sugars, into alcohol. With kombucha, you um, have SCOBY, which is a bacteria and yeast colony, and you are fermenting the sugars, which are plain table sugar, white sugar, into um, organic acids. So 
kind of like vinegar, but not the same as vinegar, but definitely kind of a sour vinegary um, flavor. The goal is not to make alcohol, although they can be a little bit of alcohol in kombucha. So this is locally made here in Okinawa, green tea kombucha, and I went ahead and bought a SCOBY also. So every fermentation, that bacteria colony um, propagates and grows more. And so if you have a friend who makes it, you can purchase you know, the, some of those propagated bits of bacteria to make your own. And so right now I have some black tea kombucha started. It's um, in its primary fermentation right now. Man, it is so easy, so easy. So if you are a, a home brewer who makes beer, I mean, this process is so, so simple compared to beer. I mean, it's really just make some tea with some sugar in it, cool it down and throw in the SCOBY and like that is it. Um, it's also really fast. So I think eh, seven to 10 days, somewhere in there is how long the first per fermentation takes. Um, and then you can flavor it and add carbonation and such if you want to. I'm going to be making a ginger kombucha because that's my favorite flavor. Um, everything I saw online, people were using fresh chunks of ginger in there. And I did want to try that, but I also wanted to try making a simple syrup with ginger or some crystallized ginger. So I did um, dice up some, some ginger and basically make ginger candy and that is currently drying. I actually popped it into my dehydrator for a minute because it wasn't drying here. Here it's very wet, very humid, and so um, I was having a hard time getting the, kombu the kombucha, the ginger dry enough to like toss it in sugar and store it. Oh, that's good. As far as home brewing goes, I am getting ready to make another batch. It's actually my husband's birthday today, so I decided to let him pick the next type of beer, and he wanted to do a Scottish ale or a Scotch heavy or something like that. His favorite drink is called a uh, kilt lifter, and I thought I would try to find a clone recipe for that. And so that will be next. Um, we're currently working on, on finishing up the last of my Orval clone. Um, as you guys are seeing, if you've watched this, it takes us a little while to get through five gallons of beer. So you have to be patient. The home brewing days are kind of few and far between. I have noticed that a lot of my brews here are just not quite tasting the way I want them to. And I suspect it's the water. The water here is very different than it was in Alaska. Um, if you're, if you're up in Alaska and a home brewer, man, you're just lucky because the water coming out of the tap is fine. It works great. It makes beautiful beer here um, the water is not it's not the same i don't know if i want to go through the process of um i haven't kind of gone down the rabbit hole of water chemistry as far as home brewing goes i just made the leap recently into all grain brewing and i think now is the time to kind of dig into water profiles and making adjustments to water so that's going to be my next sort of project is looking at water as far as um, easy ways to adjust your water chemistry for home brewing. So kombucha will be coming. I hope that this is going well. I'm trying not to go down the rabbit hole of um, kind of getting micromanagey when it comes to kombucha because I did that with beer <laughs> and I'm still doing that with beer. Like every time I brew a batch of beer, I'm spending days just sort of reading and um, trying to figure out what, what next step I can do to make it better, make it more precise, more consistent. And I think with the kombucha, I just want to make it um, an organic process. You know, this is a living creature and, and I just want to have it go on my countertop. Um, I'm not going to put it into my sort of temperature controlled fermentation uh, vessels or anything like that. I have seen a lot of people talking about batch kombucha brewing versus continuous kombucha brewing. And I'm really kind of interested in this continuous brewing where every time you pull off some kombucha, you add in some more sweet tea and then you could just kind of keep the SCOBY in there instead of, you know, having a, a separate SCOBY hotel is what they call it, or basically like, um, uh, basically removing the like batch, 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 instead having sort of a more organic continuously going process. So that might be 
that might be something I'll be looking at. I don't know. Like I said, I'm trying not to go down the rabbit hole because like all of my favorite crafts, I tend to get really obsessed with researching them and learning about them. And then next thing you know, I want all of the equipment and all of the supplies and things get kind of expensive. So we will see how that turns out in the next couple of days. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to enjoy this green tea kombucha that I bought. This is turning out to be a pretty short episode. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. The knitting has been primarily sock madness knitting. Um, I'm having a shorter turnaround between episodes because I'm really staying at home more, which means I have more time to think about uh, what I want to say to my to my viewers. So. <laughs> Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this content even though it was a little bit shorter than normal. I know I'm missing my normal life in Okinawa um, sort of history lesson but I will endeavor to continue doing that as much as I can. In the meanwhile I hope everybody is staying safe. Uh, I hope you are not going crazy. Mom, Dad, I hope uh, Mom, I hope you haven't buried Dad on the property with the backhoe. I know you two are going a little insane. That's okay. <laughs> Happy knitting guys and I'll see you next time.